So the Little Mermaid was adapted from a fairy tale that was written way back in 1830s. And while the Little Mermaid is probably the the most well-known mermaid movie, as I was doing some research, I was like, man, there's surprisingly a niche for mermaid movies, kind of like your zombie movies or your um, or your uh, superhero movies. There was a niche for mermaid movies, and so I just started going down this rabbit trail, like, wow, there's a lot more mermaid movies than I'm aware of. Notable ones that you might be familiar with, back in 1984, Tom Hanks and Splash, and then there was a rendition of the Little Mermaid story that Hong Kong made back in 1994 uh, with Christy Chung, Mermaid Got Married. And as I was watching the most recent Little Mermaid, it struck me that these movies, these mermaid movies, all have a very similar plot. It always starts with a human and a mermaid in their separate worlds. They, are, they live apart from each other. And then something happens where their lives intersect. And then they fall in love with each other. And then there's a dilemma. How do we make this work out? How, do he, how can a human live with a mermaid or vice versa? And then the solution is, at least in these movies I've seen, that someone has to make a sacrifice. Someone has to sacrifice and give up everything in their world to be in the other person's world. And so while I was watching The Little Mermaid, the new one, I noticed four major sacrifices. Now, I must warn you, there are spoilers on the li- this list, but because it is a remake that hasn't deviated, uh, you've had 34 years to watch this, so I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. So first, Ariel gives up her voice to Ursula so that she can be with Eric on land. Eric is the, is the handsome prince, and so Eric gives up her voice to be uh, to uh, gives up her voice to Ursula so she could be on Eric. The second sacrifice at towards the end of the movie, Eric is willing to give up his life to save Ariel when Ariel is captured by Ursula. And then towards the end, Ariel's dad, King Triton steps in and he saves Ariel by giving himself up to Ursula. And then at the very end, like most mermaid movies, if not all, Ariel gives up her mermaid life and her mermaid family, or her, 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 her uh, yeah, mermaid family, to be with Eric. And while the sacrifice is a theme in The Little Mermaid, and there's many more, it's definitely the theme in the Bible. You see, the very first sacrifice that we hear about is in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, when they offer sacrifices to God. Abraham then is instructed to sacrifice his son Isaac in Genesis 22. And if you've never heard that story, he doesn't. He's tested by God to sacrifice his son, but then God in place gives uh, an animal for a ram for Abraham to sacrifice. And then in Exodus chapter 12, God instructs the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb, put the blood of the lamb along the house's doorframe so that God would pass over their house, spare the firstborn firstborn son, while the rest of Egypt faced the plague of the firstborn. And so um, so the, or, so the, the Bible is littered with theme, the theme of sacrifice. Now, we're not going to get deep into any kinds of Old Testament sacrifices and how they were performed and what was needed, but I think it's worth having just a really basic foundational understanding of what a sacrifice is. And so this is how I'm going to define a sacrifice this morning. Sacrifice is giving up something important to get something else better. Sacrifice is giving up something important to get something better. Now, for some of us, you might have to sacrifice eating your favorite food so that you can be healthier. Healthier is the greater goal of just enjoying your favorite foods. As a parent or maybe as an older sibling, you sacrifice sleep so that you can provide care for younger siblings. Sleep is great. Rest is awesome. But the life of a young one under your care is much more important. So you sacrifice something for something else better. Now, in The Little Mermaid, Ariel sacrificed her voice so that she could experience love and life on land. But her sacrifice fell a little short. You see, Ariel's sacrifice led her to be captured by Ursula, and then that almost cost her everything. It almost cost her life, 
It almost cost her her lover, and even almost cost her her large merman of a father, King Triton. Now with this in mind, it makes me wonder, what is worth my sacrifice? What am I willing to sacrifice for? What is worth your sacrifice? What are you willing to, to, to sacrifice to, in order to get something better? And are the sacrifices that you and I are making, are they going to get you something better or somewhere better? Will the time or the money or the relationship or the food or the rest or whatever it is that you're sacrificing get you to somewhere or get you something better? And I hope so. You see, I'm always inspired when others sacrifice something to reach their goals and they tell their story of of what they had to do to endure the hardships to get where they're at. I I love those stories. I'm always inspired by it. But if we're going to talk about inspiration, I think, especially talking about inspiration of someone who sacrificed something while we're in church, we have to talk about Jesus and his sacrifice. And so in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes to the church of Philippi what Christ had to sacrifice. And so I'm going to read it for us this morning to remind us what Christ had to sacrifice. This is what it says. So Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ sacrificed his nature of being God and again did not consider equality with God when he was human here on earth. And the reason why Christ gave that up, gave the equality with God, was so that we might become right with God. And this is based in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God gave up, Jesus gave up his God, his God nature to be human so that when he died on the cross, we could have a right relationship with God. Now, that's a big sacrifice. It's a sacrifice on a whole other level. And in general, sacrifices aren't easy. They shouldn't be easy. If a sacrifice is easy, you're simply giving up a luxury. Sacrifices are hard. Sacrifices take a lot. And sacrifice for even Jesus wasn't easy. Jesus was tempted to go off course a handful of times throughout his time on earth. One of the first times is in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was tempted by the devil. The devil tried convincing Jesus to worship him instead of God, but Jesus did not give in. Later in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells his disciples for the very first time that he will suffer and be killed. But Peter, one of his disciples, tries to steer Jesus away from dying on the cross. This is what happens. Let me read it for us. And so Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 and on, this is what it says. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in the mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, in the response of Jesus telling his disciples that he was going to be killed, Peter rebukes Jesus, which is a bit gutsy. Jesus is Peter's master, but in rebuking Jesus, he disapproves Jesus' action. Now, I'd imagine Peter's intentions are good because he cares for Jesus. He loves Jesus, but he doesn't fully understand the sacrifice Jesus needs to make and what it means for him, Peter, and the rest of humanity. 
And in Peter's attempt to intervene, Jesus responds boldly to Peter and maybe even shockingly for some of us by saying this. This is what Jesus says to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is what he says to Peter. Jesus rebukes Peter back. Jesus calls Peter Satan and an obstacle preventing Jesus from completing his purpose. Now, I don't think that Peter was possessed by a demon or Satan at this moment, um, but Satan was trying to ruin God's plan by having Peter steer Jesus away, even in Jesus' greatest intentions. And Jesus realized that this was Satan's way of tempting him from living out his identity, from fulfilling his mission of being a a sacrifice. Satan was using Peter to tempt Jesus out of sacrificing himself for all of humanity. But Jesus stood firm in his mission and did not budge. And so in studying this passage, I noticed that Jesus was able to stay on course with his sacrifice because of two things. Sacrifice requires knowledge and discipline. First, Jesus knew what was necessary to achieve his goal. And second, he was disciplined by not letting anything distract him, taking him off course. Knowing what you need to give up is essential. Now, if your goal is to be healthy, you can't sacrifice money or sleep and expect that I'll give you what you want. Sacrificing those things gets you different results. But again, to be healthy, you have to sacrifice maybe certain foods that you like to eat or, or sacrifice time to do things that you enjoy to exercise. You have to know what to sacrifice in order to get what you want, and then you have to stay disciplined. When Jesus rebuked Peter, he told Peter that Peter didn't have in mind the concerns of God. So Peter didn't know God's concern. Peter only had concerns for himself. And so if we want to have a right relationship with Jesus, we have to know what we need to sacrifice in order to obtain it. Now I'm sure if Ariel knew what she needed to sacrifice, it would have saved her a whole lot of trouble. In sacrificing her voice to be with, to, to Ursula to be with Eric and then getting in a whole uh, um, conflict with her dad she probably could have just cut all that out gone to her dad and figured something out but again i'm sure if ariel knew or if we knew what we needed to sacrifice it would have saved us from a lot of trouble what about us what about you and i what is it that we need to sacrifice to help us grow in our relationship with jesus because jesus sacrificed himself to be in relationship with us What are we sacrificing? Are we sacrificing the right things to further our relationship with Jesus? Or maybe we are sacrificing the right things and we just need the discipline. We need to follow through with the sacrifices. As I thought about these questions, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 came to mind. And this is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sacrifice in this passage means we have to give up our old ways of thinking, our old ways and our old habits. We give up what we want because it strays us away from what God wants. And sacrifices don't have a say. Sacrifices submit to the desire of whoever is sacrificing them or offering them. So offering ourselves as living sacrifices mean we have to submit to God's desire. Now the problem with living sacrifices is that they always crawl away from the altar. But when we have the knowledge and when we have the discipline, it helps us crawl back to the altar to submit to God's desire. And knowing God's desire can help us remove those temptations that try to steer us away. 
Knowing God's desire can help us develop a goal that keeps us on track. Knowing God's desire helps us maybe create new habits and rituals to keep us on track. We begin to change our desires to align with God's desire. I want all of us to take a moment and maybe consider a habit that you have that maybe goes against God's desire. If it comes right away, praise the Holy Spirit for working in your life. And if it doesn't, take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit what you can do to help you change that habit. Be reminded of what Paul says in Romans, that we don't conform to the thinking of the world, but we transform our minds to know God's will. And I think it's totally worth it, worth us staying firm on our path to know God's desire for us. But if we don't, I think this is what happens. Back in Matthew chapter 16, after Peter rebukes, uh, after Jesus rebukes Peter, this is what he says to the rest of the disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to, be, to save their lives, life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Sacrificing to be in a relationship with Jesus is totally worth it because in the end, like Jesus said, we might gain the whole world but lose our soul. So consider what it is that you have to sacrifice and continue to stay 